Hey everybody, it's You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions. And the first question this week is an anonymous one left on my blog, stevelikestocurse.com, and it reads, I just wanted to ask your opinion on gun control laws in this country. I own a few firearms myself, so I would like to see that right intact. Many sources say the president will all but disarm us. Do you think that this fear is justified? With the president wanting to sign the UN gun treaty in March, do you think it is necessary to strip people of their guns if they have been law-abiding people? I did a whole video about this a few days ago, so I don't want to say too much more on it. Uh, but I don't know of any legitimate sources that are saying that President Obama is going to take our guns. Uh, I don't think that's a legitimate fear. I don't think I think that's just paranoia, and I don't I don't think there's anything seriously to worry about. I don't think anybody's going to come and take your guns away. Um, and I don't think it's necessary to do that. I don't think that a f I'm not, I don't support a total civilian firearms ban in the United States for one reason because it's impractical because it'll just it'll just never happen politically practically it's just it's too big of a job to get that severe of a law through the legislature and signed and then to enforce it can you imagine the manpower needed to go around to every single home <laughs> in the United States and and collect the firearms that may be there I mean uh, that it's it, it it's just it's just never going to happen and it doesn't need to happen i think i think stricter regulations i think licensing i think permits i think doing away with uh assault rifles i think doing away with uh you know detachable magazines or high capacity magazines uh things like that i i think there are ways to vastly improve our gun policy in the u.s and make it way more sensible uh, without repealing the Second Amendment or without banning firearms altogether. I think there are, there are uh, lots of very sensible, to me very obvious things that we can and should be doing that, that fall far, far short of, of a total gun ban. That's not something I support. And again, it's not something that's ever going to happen. Val3Y, or Valley or Valey, however that's pronounced, I apologize for fucking up the pronunciation of your name. Uh, being a devout Christian at one point myself, why do you think people just skim over the inane BS in these books? I remember reading a passage about King David killing hundreds of men by himself. I remember trying to convince myself that it was true. I think it's dogma. What's the deal? Yeah, I think it's dogma. I think you're right. I, I think people, when, you, when you're brought up in a religious tradition, uh, you're, you're, you're not taught to think critically about the text. You're taught to accept it, and you're taught to try and understand it with the underlying presumption that it's true. Uh, so I think that's it. I think that's it. I mean, I remember uh, I had a, a, a professor in college who said that even though she herself was not especially religious, uh, she thought that people should, uh, when they have children, they should send their children to Sunday school. Uh, no matter what religion they are or what they feel about God or whatever, because the Bible, for better or worse, is one of the most influential and fundamental uh, texts of our society, and biblical literacy is very important. And so you should, you should send your children to Sunday school so that they, they can be, become biblically literate. And I, I, I actually kind of... The, the cat wants to come up here. Would you like to see the kitty? There she is. She wanted to get up on Papa's lap. Um, uh, I think biblical literacy is important, but I also think that that you know going to church and going to Sunday school is the worst possible way to learn biblical literacy because you don't learn how to think critically about it. You're not taught it as a literature text. You're taught it as the Word of God, and I and uh, and that's why people are able to read past the bullshit and not realize how outrageously, how, how self-refuting it is in many ways. Because they're not taught to look at it that way. They're taught to look at it as, oh, this is the word of God. This should actually happen. Yeah, of course King David killed, you know, a thousand men with the, the jawbone of an ass or whatever the story is. I mean, of, of, of course they believe that because that they're taught that, that well, this really happened. You know, they're, they're just responding with the skills they've been given to respond with. Brandmon asks, why does DS9 seem to be the most underrated of all Star Trek series? 
I thought it's subordinate to the big two that I watched previously, TOS and TNG, and I was skeptical regarding it being based on a stationary space station. But after having watched three seasons so far, as someone who loved TNG, I'd say DS9 completely won me over. Furthermore, is there any reason to check out Voyager and Enterprise after I finished DS9, except for hot ex-Borg chick and I have nothing better to do, <laughs> respectively? I think it's because, uh, especially in those early seasons that you've been watching, the first three years, uh, Deep Space Nine was a very different show than The Next Generation was. I mean, not superficially. I mean, it's all the same Star Trek stuff. They're wearing the uniforms and they're, you know, talking to the same aliens and all that. It's the same world. But uh, Deep Space Nine was interested in different things than The Next Generation was. Deep Space Nine actually has a lot more in common with more modern drama series than Next Generation does. Next Generation is very much uh, an old-fashioned sort of 70s, 80s adventure show, whereas Deep Space Nine was beginning to transition more into what we see now with dramas uh, dealing, being, being more interested in serialized storytelling and not just in the relationships of characters, but in seeing how those relationships change and evolve over the course of, of, the, of the series. Deep Space Nine was really interested in that, and that was a break from Next Generation, because Next Generation, even though it was a terrific show, it maintained its status quo pretty much from beginning to end. You know, the relationship between Picard and Riker never really changed throughout the run of the show. The relationships between, you know, they established that Geordi and Data were friends, and that was just sort of it. You know, that was, it was just taken as that was just the status quo for the rest of the show. Whereas Deep Space Nine, things were constantly being changed, and characters' relationships were constantly growing and changing and evolving, and people were growing closer or growing further apart or shifting allegiances. There was a lot of that going on. And I think a lot of Star Trek fans at the time maybe just didn't dig that. You know, they wanted the more superficial, rousing adventure and uh, sort of pat moral and political commentary that they found on TNG, and DS9 was trying to do something a little more complex than that. And when it succeeded, it was a, it was a great show. I agree with you. I think Deep Space Nine is my, it's still my favorite Star Trek show. Um, as for Voyager and Enterprise, uh, no, I don't think there's any reason to watch those. Uh, they each have some good episodes peppered throughout, but as a whole, I think both shows were awful. Uh, and Enterprise was especially disappointing because I'm such a big Scott Bakula fan. Uh, I just think he's terrific. And but Enterprise overall, for the most part, I think is just which it just wasn't a very interesting show. And neither was Voyager. That was that was their great sin. It wasn't so much that they were like outrageously bad. They were just dull. There just nothing happened. There's no reason to watch them. You know, there was nothing compelling going on. So yeah, if, if you feel like skipping <laughs> after you finish Deep Space Nine, as far as I'm concerned, you're not missing anything. Stimuli asks, Steve, you seem to do many of your videos without reading from a script, although it's pretty obvious you do use some sort of prepared guidelines. How do you get through such dense oratory without ever tripping over your words? I see little evidence of retake editing. Is this due to your chosen profession, or do you just have lots of experience in public speaking? I don't have that much experience in public speaking, actually. I, it's just something that I've learned as I've done these YouTube videos. When I first started uh, making these, the, the only ones I ever really made regularly were the riffing on mail call videos, and those are scripted. Uh, those are carefully scripted. Pretty much everything I say in, in the riffing on mail call video, for the most part, is something that I have scripted ahead of time. There are I do change things or ad-lib things here and there, but overall it's a scripted video. And so are the Five Stupid Things videos. Those are, those are scripted. Uh, and for a while those were the only types of videos I really felt comfortable doing because I couldn't think of what to say extemporaneously in front of the camera. It was, you, I would just draw a blank. And, uh, and I tried a few times. There were early videos where I actually attempted to, you know, speak extemporaneously about a story in the news or something that happened and I just I had I had I had to give up I didn't end up even finishing the video because uh, I just I just had nothing and I've gotten over that as you can tell uh, since then and now it just comes very naturally to me so it's just it's a learned skill um, and as for not doing very many retakes I actually this this right here that I'm that you are seeing at this moment is a retake I tried to do this a minute ago and I fucked it up and I went back to the beginning and did it again so this is actually a retake there are a lot more retakes in my stuff even the stuff that seems very natural and off the cuff and unscripted like like this video which is not scripted but I do sometimes 
fuck up a take and feel the need to go back and do it again. Uh, and that, it happens a lot. And I'm glad that it's not glaringly obvious. <laughs> but it does happen a lot. 22 Steve 5150. Since you like pro wrestling and hate Hulk Hogan, how about this one? What is your favorite Hulk Hogan moment in the ring and out of the ring? Begin torturing yourself now. I See, I've actually got you on this one. I do hate Hulk Hogan now, but when I was a kid, I was totally a Hulkamaniac, man. I bled red and yellow. So actually coming up with my favorite uh, a Hulk Hogan moment isn't really all that difficult. For me, it was his... Uh, his comeback promo after the the earthquake angle in 1990. For those of you who don't remember that or don't know what the hell I'm talking about, after Hulk Hogan lost the WWF title to the Ultimate Warrior at WrestleMania VI, uh, he kind of just did nothing for a few months. They would have him on TV and he would beat uh, enhancement talent here and there, but he didn't really have a story. And then they did an angle on the Brother Love Show where Earthquake attacked him and jumped on him and broke his ribs uh, within the, the storyline. And he was out for a while. They, had, they did the stretcher job. He was taken away by paramedics. And they put over on TV how terribly injured he was. And they basically said that that was it for Hulk Hogan, that he was retiring, he was done. And at the time that this was happening, I was 9, 10 years old, and I bought it. I, didn't, I hadn't caught on yet that, that wrestling was fake. And I figured that Hulk Hogan was just out, you know. And when they said he was he was going to have to retire, that that was that that was what was going to happen. And so they had him come on uh, Superstars one week, a, a month or so after this uh, event, and he was supposed to give his his farewell speech. And about halfway through the speech, he he turns, and when he gets to the point where you know, he's going to say, I'm, I'm retiring, or thank you very much, I'm going to have to walk away, or whatever. He turns and he announces instead that, that, that he's not retiring, and that he's coming back, and that he's going to face Earthquake and get his revenge and everything. And now I look back on it, and it's classic, you know, pro wrestling booking. Of course that's what was going to happen. That's the whole reason they did it, so that Hogan could come back, and it would be a really hot revenge angle. And it was really good, actually. The matches didn't turn out to be that great, but the, the story was great. And, and that's my favorite Hulk Hogan moment, is, uh, is that comeback promo. And my favorite out-of-the-ring Hogan moment, I, I can't think of anything specific, but, but pretty much any time when he tells a story to an interviewer nowadays, ab about the old days, and is obviously just making shit up and lying his self-aggrandizing ass off, he is a total old-school, like, fake-ass, carny, full-of-shit asshole like a lot of old school wrestlers are because that's just the culture in which they were brought up you know B but Hogan is especially egregious with it you know Hogan just lies his ass off to make himself look good at every possible opportunity and now I find it really sad and contemptible but at the same time it's really really fun to laugh at him and that's that that's those would be my favorite out of the ring Hogan moments practical magic nine hmm okie dokie favorite Catwoman. Probably Julie Newmar. Uh, it's tough, though, because Anne Hathaway was really awesome in Dark Knight Rises. I was very impressed by her performance. Uh, but I probably Julie Newmar. Quetzalcoatl 2012. Did you like the show Smallville? Yeah, I watched Smallville regularly for about the first three or four years, and then I kind of drifted away from it. But uh, when I was watching it, I thought it was great for the most part. There were parts of it that I didn't that I didn't like. I, I hated all that shit with, like, the... Uh, the cave paintings, you know, the Kryptonian cave painting. I just thought that was so boring and stupid. Uh, but the stuff between Clark and Lex was amazing. I really, really loved all that stuff. Uh, but I eventually kind of lost interest in the show. I would, I would dip into it here and there uh, over the years, but I never really got back into it after those first three or four years and uh, had a huge crush on Allison Mack. Whew! Goddamn. Ryan Luberkey, hey Steve, just wondering, why atheism and not agnosticism? I like the perspective that holds that uh, atheism and agnosticism are addressing two different questions. Um, and agnosticism is a statement of your knowledge. So I say, I don't know for sure whether God exists or not. Therefore, I am an agnostic. But 
I also go a step further than that. I don't just stay there and say, well, hey, I don't know whether there is one or not. I have come to a conclusion based on my own understanding of the world and of the evidence around me and my own experiences and et cetera, et cetera. And I have said, even though I don't know for certain that God does or does not exist, based on what I've seen, I conclude that God doesn't exist or at least that the, the probability of him existing is so low that it makes no sense to assume that he exists. It makes much more sense to assume that he doesn't exist. And the odds are nowhere near even. It's not like 50-50, so you should just say, hey, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. The, 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 the probabilities are so far tilted in the direction of there not being a God that it only makes sense to me to assume and to say and, and to live life uh, as though God gods do not exist. So that's why I'm an atheist and not an agnostic. There's nothing wrong with being an agnostic. Uh, I have no problem with agnosticism or people who identify as agnostics, but I call myself an atheist and that's why. Precambrian lullaby. Dude, really? What is your favorite version of the film Zatoichi? Sorry, I know you've asked this question like three times and I haven't gotten around to it and I know it's just been because there have been so many other questions and I just haven't been able to fit it in and that's totally the only reason. And my favorite uh, uh, Zatoichi movie, I really like the second one. Oh my god, what is that over there? Is that Jim Varney? I, I've never seen a Zatoichi movie. The Metal Headiest asks, what do you make out of the video of Robbie Parker, supposedly a parent of one of the victims in the Connecticut massacre caught laughing before getting into character to be interviewed because I honestly have no idea what to think of it. Also, apparently Sandy Hook was written on a map in bold letters in Batman Dark Knight Rises. I'm not a conspiracy theorist by no means, but I found these things interesting. I would really like to hear your take on this. Well, here's my take on it. Um, I, I looked it up. I looked up the Dark Knight Rises stuff. I, I watched this the Robbie Parker video and my thoughts on it are that there's nothing to it, that it's, it's mindless, meaningless, delusional conspiracy theorist paranoia. And it's kind of offensive, especially the bit about uh, the parent of the dead child. Uh, if you watch that video, or the, the, the version of it that I watched, uh, uh, you watch the, the video of the parent, Robbie Parker, coming out, and he's smiling at first, and then he asks, are we ready? And then he starts giving his statement to the, uh, the press, and he starts to sort of, you know, sigh, and it looks like he's getting a little more upset. And the person who posted the video and, and was questioning the sincerity of this man was in interjecting little comments with title cards, saying things like, uh, oh, he's smiling, and now he's getting into character before he makes his statement. And, uh, oh, he's hyperventilating. That's what actors do when they're trying to look upset. Really? You know a lot about actors? You're, you're an expert on how actors prepare to feel emotional before scenes. You're, that's what they do, how huh? they hyperventilate. That's, that's what actors do? Okay, as long as you know. As long as you're an expert on that. As long as you have some experience you're drawing from. And this, you know, this idea that he's, it's, it's suspicious because he's, he's behaving inappropriately. Well, you know what? Lots of people in real life situations behave in ways that you or I or people in general might think is inappropriate, but they do. They do it all the time. I, I myself have been in situations where I have, I have laughed at inappropriate times, you know, where I've, 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 and sometimes it's because I'm nervous. Sometimes it's, it's like some sort of defense mechanism where I, you, you just don't know what else to do. Uh, People don't always behave the way we expect them to. People don't always behave in predictable or logical ways. It doesn't mean that the guy isn't really the parent of a dead child or that he's part of some conspiracy theory. I, I, the really frustrating thing is that there, there aren't even any claims being made by the few people who are pushing this, this idea, They're, that are spreading these suspicions. Like, oh, why was he laughing and why did he say that and why was he hyperventilating? And look, he wasn't even crying. There weren't even any tears. What are you saying? What are you saying? Make your claim. Make your argument. Tell me what you think is happening. Do you think he's a plant? Do you think his daughter wasn't really killed? Do you think he is making these statements as some sort of secret, you know, push 
to, to in, in, impose gun control on the country, whatever he's, make a claim. What are you saying? That's the most frustrating thing about conspiracy theorists like this, is that they, they ask all of these leading questions, they make all these suspicious statements, right? But they never make a claim. They don't have the balls to actually say what they are saying. What are you saying? Don't imply. State. What are you saying? What's your argument? Uh, and the same thing with the Dark Knight stuff. Um, what are you, again, what are you saying? Are you saying that the producers of The Dark Knight Rises were involved in planning this, this, this school massacre as, as a pretense for what? For imposing gun control? To, to provide like some sort of a, an excuse for pushing through gun control legislation? Uh, you know, because I guess the shooting at the theater during the premiere of that movie wasn't enough, so they staged another shooting, and they said, fuck it, we're really going to stick it to them this time, let's have kids get killed in this one. I mean, what are you saying? You know, that, yeah, there was, there's, there's an incident of uh, the, uh, one of the areas in a map of Gotham is labeled Sandy Hook, and it, it, it is apparently the location of uh, the, the football stadium that Bane blows up, and people are like, oh, my, oh, look, Sandy Hook, what a coincidence. Yeah, that's exactly right, a coincidence. It's a coincidence. It means nothing. There are lots of places in the country named Sandy Hook, not just that elementary school. In fact, there's a beach in New Jersey called Sandy Hook that is a lot more famous and well-known than this school in Connecticut ever was before this horrible tragedy took place. If you're making a Batman movie that takes place in a major northeastern metropolis that is supposed to be like a, a, a stand-in for New York City, and there's a, a place in New Jersey right next to New York City, that happens to be named Sandy Hook, and you're looking for names of places in your imaginary New York-like city, I don't know, maybe the New Jersey Sandy Hook is what they're referring to, not the fucking elementary school in Connecticut that nobody had even heard of until this happened. Hmm? You think maybe? It's a coincidence. It means absolutely nothing. And, and for people to push this sort of thing and to treat it like it's anything at all other than baseless paranoia is infuriating. It's the absolute epitome of mindlessness. There's nothing to it. And metalheadiest, I'm not yelling at you. I, you're, just, you, you're just asking me a question. You say you're not a conspiracy theorist. You're just wondering about it. Well, here's what I think. It's nothing. It's nothing. There's nothing to it. I don't buy it. You shouldn't buy it either. Anybody who does buy it or who thinks there's anything to these pointless, paranoid ramblings should be ashamed of themselves. Use your fucking brain. It means nothing. And that was the final question. Uh, it's nice that we began and ended on school shooting questions. I like that. Uh, let's do a shout out. The shout out this week goes to a really awesome channel that I just discovered. It's Coast to Coast, uh, C O S E, numeral 2 C O S E. And why did I spell it out when it is on your screen at this very moment? I have no idea. But anyway, uh, these guys do a, a, a biblical satire series called Bible Answers that is so funny. It's really funny and it's really well written and, and well performed and uh, it's like a Bible Answers call-in show, but very, very funny, very sarcastic and satirical. And uh, they, they've, been, they've been uploading a lot of older episodes that they've done in years past and they're gearing up to start producing new ones and it's really cool. I've really had a good time going back and looking at their old episodes. Some of it's really funny and, and they have a very, very low amount of subscribers at the moment. And uh, a lot of you guys may not have ever even heard of them, but you should, you should check them out. They're awesome. I actually found them through Wildwood Claire. I noticed she's been commenting and liking their videos, and that's, that's how I found them. So Claire, I owe you one for that. And everybody else, if you haven't heard of uh, Coast to Coast and Bible Answers, check them out. They are awesome. And that's all for this week. I will be back to do this again next week. Uh, but before I can answer your questions, you have to ask. So if you have a question for me about anything at all, Please leave a comment on this video, ask me your question, and I will try to get to it in the next one if I possibly can. I have had more questions than I could use every time I've done this. I've had to whittle them down, and this time, here's what I do, for those of you who are wondering. I limit myself to two typed out pages. These, these are the questions that I answer in the video. I weed it down to whatever will fit on two single-spaced type pages. And I had to leave out a couple of really, really good questions this time that I, I wish I could have answered, but I really don't want these videos to end up being incredibly long. And they're already long enough as far as I'm concerned. 
So uh, if, if you have asked a question of me in the past and I haven't gotten to it yet and you really want to know, please feel free to ask it again in the future. I don't mind that at all. And don't take it personally if I don't get to your question. Uh, if you thought you had a great question and I didn't fit it into the video, it probably was a great question and I just, I just couldn't fit it in. Uh, it, there, it's also possible that it was just a really stupid question and I didn't feel like talking about it. But you'll never know. I'll never point you out in person uh, specifically and say your question sucked and your question was awesome but I just didn't have time. I'm not going to do that. So just if, you, if your question gets left out, just assume that it was because I just had to cut it for time and I actually thought it was an awesome question. You know, you'll feel better that way, I think. And I'll never, I'll never tell you any different. All right, that's it, guys. I'll see you next week. Thanks for your questions, and thanks for watching. And have a good holiday, if I don't see you before, which I will. But just in case I don't, have a good holiday.